الله الرحمن الرحيم نبدأ فعالية جمعية أطباء الباطنية في بيقاع وتحت عنوان Updates in Nephrology وبرعاية شركة أسينو السويسرية ويتفضل الآن الأستاذ الدكتور عباس فاضل رئيس الجمعية مشكورا لبدء فعاليات الملتقى شكرا جزيلا شكرا جزيلا دكتور ليث السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته مساء الخير والعافية والورد والياسمين من علمني حرفا ملكني عبدا تحية حب وتقدير واحترام لمن علمنا الالتزام وحب العلم والإخلاص في العمل والإبداع أستاذنا الفاضل الأستاذ الدكتور إحسان الشماع له منا كل الشكر والتقدير لمشاركته في هذه الفعالية العلمية المتميزة الممزوجة بالرغبة في سماع صوته ورؤيته متمنين له دوام الصحة والعافية والعمر المديد أجمل الترحيب بكل أساتذتي وأخواني وأخواتي الحضور مع حفظ الألقاب والمسميات والشكر والتقدير لشركة أسينو السويسرية الداعمة لهذه الفعالية العلمية أهلا وسهلا بالجميع أرحب بأخي العزيز المبدع الدكتور ضياء خلف العمري استشاري في الطب الباطني أستاذ مساعد في كلية الطب وعميد كلية طب الأسنان لإدارة الجلسة فليتفضل مشكورا تفضل دكتور ضياء شكرا جزيلا دكتور عباس بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين رحم الله أحمد شوقي إذ قال قف للمعلم وفه التبجيل كاد المعلم أن يكون رسولا نعم اليوم مع معلمنا الأول مع أستاذنا الكبير العلم الذي لا يضاهيه علم بيرق العلم من كان ذاك النجم الساطع في سماء الباطنية كل أطباء الباطنية مدينون لأستاذنا الفاضل الأستاذ القدير والكبير صاحب القلب الكبير والعلم الغزير الأستاذ الفاضل الدكتور إحسان الشماع أستاذ الفاضل أنا أصغر من أن أقدمك تحيتي ومودتي لك أستاذنا الفاضل سيقدم لنا ولكم اليوم محاضرته بعنوان لوبس أبديت أنا ممتن جدا أستاذ شكرا جزيلا للجميع شكرا جزيلا للدكتور عباس فاضل شكرا جزيلا للدكتور ضياء خلف على التقديم الذي لا أستحقه بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أول ما نبدأ أن نذكر زملائنا كوكبة الشهداء من الأطباء الذين ارتفعوا للشهادة في خدمة المرضى في زمن الوباء نقرأ للجميع سورة الفاتحة بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نحمد وإياك نستعين من الصلاة المستقيم صلاة الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغمور عليهم صلاة الله وندعو للشفاء لجميع مرضى العراقيين المصابين ب داء الكورونا الشفاء العاجل إن شاء الله للجميع وبادئ ذي بدء أشكر جمعية أطباء ذي قار على الدعوة الكريمة لمشاركتي في فعالياتهم وتعليمهم العلمي المستمر المبارك الذي طالما أتابعه وأبارك لهم هذا الجهد وأتمنى لهم التوفيق إن شاء الله في جهودهم مستقبلا لخير البلاد والعباد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم I'd like to share to you this and share with you this evening some of the ground points on the subject of lupus Kaposi was the first to, to recognize SLE in 1872 and was followed by Fernet, who described it in 1908. Before that time, 
SLE was considered to be an unfatal disfiguring skin disease only. Now we know that this is chronic inflammatory disease, which is characterized by the course of alternating exacerbations and remission, and autoimmune multisystemic disease in which the immune system produces autoantibodies against a variety of autoantigens. In 1948, it was the birth of the LA cell. The, but this picture is not of 1948. This picture was published in the Journal of Arthritis and Rheumatology, the Journal of the American College of Rheumatology, and two years ago, in 2018, for a patient, a 24-year-old old woman with a history of SLE, who presented with fever, arthralgia, and neutropenia. Neutropenia. The results of the physical exam and routine lab evaluations were unremarkable. However, examination of the peripheral blood smear showed these neutrophils engulfing homogeneous nuclear material. The yellow arrows shows the nuclear material confirming a suspected diagnosis of lupus flare. Lupus-associated antineutral antibodies opsonize in nuclear proteins released from dying optotic cells with uptake by phagocytic cells, including polymorphs and macrophages. And this is what we call the LA cell. The LA cell first described in 1948 it's usually in the bone marrow preparation from patients with SLE, and they are rarely identified on peripheral blood smears, but may be found during acute flares. So sometimes it helps to diagnose acute flare of lupus from examination of peripheral blood smear, like this one. What is the background of lupus? Pathogenesis of lupus is driven by a combination of both genetic risk and environmental influences. It has a heterogeneous clinical manifestation. No patient is similar to another one. And it has very complicated genetics. Genetic studies have identified numerous susceptible loci, and more and more are now discovered. Most of the confirmed SLA risk are near uh, uh, the immune system function, or they've got uh, uh, a link with the immune system function. We now know that lupus is a disease of high morbidity and mortality. Early in the course of the disease, the patients may succumb to active disease, vasculitis or pulmonary alveolar hemorrhage, or lupus nephritis and renal failure. Also, they must succumb to infection because of the high dose of steroids and immunosuppressions, which are used for induction of remission. And this will, will lead to uh, the risk of infection. Later on, if the patient survived the acute or early stages, later on, he will run the cardiovascular disease risk with time. Cardiovascular disease risk in lupus is due to combination of the classic disease plus the risk which are unique to the disease and its treatment, notably steroids. Also, the patient might have problem with bones, osteoporosis, osteonecrosis, avascular necrosis of the hip, and throughout the disease, patients always run the risk of cancer. Why? Because of the profound immunosuppression, a condition which is similar to uh, uh, what we see in patients with organ transplant. Lupus survival has improved. There's no doubt about that. Now, in the, in the 1950s, only 50% 50 of patients with SLE survive five years after diagnosis. 
Now, thanks to better treatment, early diagnosis, up to eight to nine percent will survive at least 10 years. The outcome of patients with lupus is determined by two major factors. The most important factor, their factor, is disease activity, continuous disease activity. And the other one is the steroid dose. High disease activity is bad. Long-term steroids is also as bad as high disease activity. So we should have a balance between these two factors. <clears throat> Lupus has any predictable cause for the flares and remission. The inflammatory changes may be reversible. However, the damage which is done to the organs is itself not reversible. Damage is done to the organs, there will be damage throughout. The risk of organ damage is manifested mainly by the three major organs, the kidney, cardiovascular, and cerebrovascular. As regards the kidney, up to 60% or probably 70% of adult patients with SLE will develop lupus nephritis, and a portion of them will go to end-stage renal disease. This might be more common, more severe in childhood onset than adult onset SLE. As regards cardiovascular and cerebrovascular disease, there is also very much increased, many times greater risk of coronary heart disease and stroke in patients with lupus. Early, early organ damage is associated with reduced 10-year survival and one third of patients will show permanent organ damage within five years of diagnosis. Any organ of the body can be involved. Starting from the skin up to the brain, the joints, the blood, hematologic manifestations, kidney, etc. And the risk of this organ damage remains high throughout life of the patient. Increased disease activity increases the risk of organ damage and mortality as well. Even low disease activity, if it is persistent, is associated with organ damage. And said now, there is a study in rheumatology 2012 showed that one point increase in the BLAG score, which is the British Island Lupus uh, uh, score, there is a so much increase in new organ damage, cardiovascular, pulmonary, musculoskeletal damage, etc., as well as 15 increase in mortality risk. And this is depicted in this graph. With years, there will be more and more organ damage over five years of follow-up. Flares are very common in lupus. And one of the main objectives of treatment is to prevent flares. Because fewer flares means less organ damage. Much better for the patient to have fewer flares, although you can't treat them, but fewer flares will mean less organ damage. And there are a constellation of symptoms which predict the flare of lupus. Symptoms-wise, I should stress on fatigue. Fatigue is emerging as an important symptom of lupus activity. It's been one of the markers that usually we follow in studies of lupus and in the clinical follow-up of a patient. Other markers are uh, the renal, neurologic, vascular involvement, increase in double strand, anti double strand DNA, and these days in a bliss level, which is the B lymphocyte stimulator level. Complements are low, are depressed, as well as other factors. 
and these flares should be and can be prevented and managed by education and lifestyle modification. Fatigue, for example, I usually used to advise patients, my patients with lupus and still advise them that they should have a nap that is sleeping during the afternoon. This will help a lot the symptom of fatigue, fatigue in these patients. In addition to activity, we have the adverse effect of steroids. Steroids have adverse effects on the course of the disease, and these are dose and time dependent. Uh, risk of harm is less likely if you keep the dose of prednisolone to less than five milligram a day, less, less than five milligram a day. High cumulative average dose significantly increases the risk of irreversible organ damage. Also, steroids have a profound effect on the rate of cardiovascular events, cardiovascular risk. Patients who are on, on steroid dose more than 10 milligrams a day show significantly high rates of cardiovascular events. The more the dose, the higher the risk of cardiovascular risk. This cartoon depict, outline simply what is the pathophysiology of SLA. The B lymphocytes play a central role in the pathology of lupus. Together, the major players, the big players in, in, in SLA are the cytokines, the April and the bliss and the interferon alpha upstairs. These three major players with the B lymphocytes play the pathogenesis of SLA. We'll come to one, each of one of these as we proceed to the, to the management. What we have in treatment of SLA, what we call standard of care therapy. Standard of care therapy, it starts from aspirin to hydroxychloroquine, corticosteroids, and these are since the 40s and the 50s of the last century. And then others were added, non-steroidals, methotrexate, methotrexate, cyclophosphamide, oron and IV, and MMF. This is what we call standard of care, steroids and immunosuppression. This cartoon showed to us the new concept in the management of lupus, is that we target the cytokine. We try to block the cytokines, which play a major role in the pathogenesis of lupus. Notably, these are the interferons alpha, and the bliss and the April, which are beta cell activating factors. We come to them shortly. The dendritic cells play a role in producing these cytokines, which stimulate and proliferate the B cells and lupus. So the new drugs, so-called, they are not more new, the drugs the biological drugs are invented to block these cytokines, an attempt to block the activity of the B cells and the lupus. First, we start with interferon. Sorry. Interferon. Interferons play a role in lupus and uh, they stimulate the B cells. And so the blockade of interferons uh, play a part in the management of lupus patients. This was one of the studies, beautiful studies I found it, published in the Journal of Experimental Medicine in 23. 
20 or 3. And this shows the level of interferon in patients with lupus compared to control healthy subjects. So, type 1 interferon alpha as a target in SL. This beautiful picture shows the interferon signature in active lupus patient. These leukocytes with the red color, they show the upregulation of the interferon, uh, uh, which is called interferon signature. Interferon, interferon signature. The same genes can be found in the peripheral mononuclear cells, peripheral blood mononuclear cells. Compared to healthy subjects, the interferon signature in patients with lupus is quite high, particularly in the subpopulation of patients which have high disease activity, as we can see later. Another study, which is published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science early in 20, also three, and this also shows similar pictures of the patient with lupus who showed dysregulated expression genes in the interferon pathway. And this interferon gene expression, or we call it signature, interferon signature, served as a marker of more severe disease involving major organs, kidneys, hemopoietic cells, or central nervous system, and also it identifies a subgroup of patients who will benefit from therapies targeting or directed against the interferon pathway. This one of the pictures of this study also showed that the red indicates the genes expressed at high level to re relative to the control or healthy subjects. And this means that these genes related to interferon alpha are upregulated. And this is called the interferon signature in these patients. While the control have low levels of gene uh, uh, expression. Another picture similar to that one. This is sort shown and the peripheral blood mononuclear cells. The same idea. This interferon signature is higher in patients with lupus, particularly active lupus, compared to healthy controls or compared to lupus patients with low activity. Okay? And this picture is very informative and it shows four panels. The A panel shows to you that the interferon score is much higher in a group of patients with SLE. Usually, these patients have a severe disease. So they've got a higher interferon expression or higher interferon signature. In the B1, you can see the more you collect a criteria of SLE, more than four, more than four, there will be up rise in the interferon signature. Very significant one. In C, you can see the same thing, that the interferon uh, uh, high people have got higher criteria for SLE than those with low interferon signature. Similarly, in a group D, you can see that patients who've got high interferon signature have more involvement of the kidney, CNS, and the blood. Okay?
this study or which shows activation of the interferon alpha pathways identify a subgroup of SLE patients with distinct serologic features and active disease. As you can see, although the picture is a bit stretched, this is published in Arthritis Rheumatism Journal in 05 and shows you the difference of the interferon pathway signature between patients with SLE, rheumatoid arthritis, and healthy donors, and healthy donors. One of the drugs, biologics, which have been used and tried, which is directed against type 1 interferon alpha, is any frulimab which is a fully human IgG monoclonal antibody that binds to interferon receptors and prevent the signaling by all types of type 1 interferons in these patients. Based on the previous studies that patients with high disease activity have got high interferon signature. And this study in arthritis and rheumatology, which showed that this drug, Malagix, significantly reduced disease activity compared with placebo across many clinical endpoints in patients with moderate and severe lupus erythematosus. The first picture of this study, which showed you that many of the parameters of the disease were more in favor of the using of the drug in a dose of 300 milligram or 1,000 milligram. Efficacy results at week 52 in patients with SLE receiving 300 or 1,000 milligram. But this treatment with anifrolamab led to a greater rate of response against multiple endpoints. The benefit observed in the overall modified treatment with the high interferon uh, uh, gene signature showed uh, a significant difference to the placebo, to the placebo. The other graph which is reported by these people, also showed you the difference between three group of patients. Pa all patients, patients with high interferon, interferon signature and patients with low interferon signature. And the treatment either with a placebo or 300 milligram of the enifrolimab or 1,000 milligrams. This is another one of the same study, which shows some of the effect of the drug on organs. The upper pictures depicted the response of cutaneous lupus to the drug, and the graph shows the difference between the two doses and the placebo. The down, down, down one shows you the involvement of the joints, active joints, swollen, tender joints, and the response uh, manifested by less and less joint involved with the treatment compared to the placebo, compared to the placebo. Organ-specific efficacy results over time in patients with SLA with this treatment. The first picture was continuous and the second one was with the tender joints. The high interferon a group of subpopulation of lupus are likely, are more likely to benefit from the treatment than the low one compared to the standard of care therapy. 
which is considered in this steady placebo. However, a dose-related increase was observed in the occurrence of upper respiratory tract infections and reactivation of herbal zoster. The dosage-related increase in these infections, together with the fact that increasing the dose of the drug from 300 to 1,000 doesn't confer any advantage. It doesn't lead to better response or to increase in efficacy. So the conclusion was that there is no point of giving a high dose 1,000, and instead 300 milligram would be sufficient, would have the full effect, would keep the adverse effect as low as possible. Another study which shows the relation between the level of the B lymphocyte stimulator, which is cytokine, which stimulates the B lymphocytes, and type 1 interferon inducible gene signature. As you can see from this graph, the accumulation of the interferon alpha signature with the increase in the level of the B lymphocyte stimulator. Another graph showing this, this was presented at the ULAR 2012 by Sihan et al. group, which shows that the impact of interferon signals on B lymphocyte stimulator levels. Compared to the control, you can see when they have high interferon signature, there will be higher level of B lymphocyte level, or high level of B lymphocyte stimulator. While with low interferon signature, there will be much less level of the B lymphocyte stimulator. So there is interaction between these major players and the stimulation of B lymphocytes in lupus. This year, early in this year, in the New England Journal of Medicine, in January this year, yeah, in January this year, the New England Journal of Medicine published a trial of any frilumab in active SLE. And it shows that monthly administration of this biologic resulted in a higher percentage of patients with response by defined by the composite endpoint within or at 52 weeks. And the frequency of herbicide was higher as expected compared to the placebo. This is the summary of the of the study. This is one of the figures of the study, which shows that the panel A shows you the BLAC response over time in patients with high uh, uh, interferon signature. As you can see from the red line, this is 300 milligram compared to the placebo. And there is Different significant one between the two groups. And the lower panel, you can see that compared to placebo, the rate at which flare develops in these patients on drug on treatment is much lower than placebo. So the risk of flare is less in these patients while on treatment. The positive results of this study suggest that the presence of high interferon alpha signature may be a useful marker in identifying patients who could be expected to respond to this specific antagonist. As might be expected, frequencies of viral infections, herbicide, were increased in patients on interferon. Another biologic 
another biologic which is being, which was the first one to be approved by FDA for the treatment of lupus is belimumab. Belimumab is a bliss antagonist. It acts against the B lymphocyte stimulator. Acts as against the B lymphocyte stimulator in lupus. The results of this study suggest that the B lymphocyte stimulator marker may be a useful marker for early activation of the autoimmune diathesis and likely plays a critical role in triggering activation of the autoimmune B cells in human SLA. So this may provide uh, an effective therapeutic target in systemic autoimmunity. This was published in the Journal of Immunology early in the 20s, 21. As you can see, depicted in this graph, that patient, there's a gr two groups of patients with lupus. A subpopulation with low bliss and subpopulation with high bliss level, B lymphocyte stimulator level. So not all the patients with lupus have got a high B lymphocyte stimulator. Around 40 to 50 percent of all patients with lupus have got a high B lymphocyte level. So what does this biologic act, where does it act? As you can see from this cartoon, it, see it acts to block the B cells activating factors, mainly the B lymphocyte one. B cells activating factors are now we can consider it as two. The B lymphocyte stimulator, which is targeted by the lymphoma, and the April, which is the uh, proliferation in using ligand factor, which is targeted by other drug. We'll see it if we have time to go to the other drug. It's well established that both B lymphocyte stimulators and April, both of them are B cells activating factors, have got roles in the pathogenesis of B cell mediated autoimmunity with elevated serum levels correlating with disease severity and activity in patients with lupus. This phase three randomized trial, which is published in Arthritis and Rheumatology in 2011, starting to use to study the belumumab as monoclonal antibody that inhibits the B lymphocyte stimulator in patients with active lupus. And it showed that when it's used with the standard of care therapy, it significantly improved the, it significantly improved the SLE uh, 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 right, responder index, which we call SRI, and reduced uh, disease activity and severe flares, and was generally well correlated in patients with lupus. And this is what we can see that when you have a fall in the panel A, there is a fall in the level of anti double strand level. In panel B, you can see an increase in complement C4 because a low C4 is a marker of disease activity in lupus. So, with the treatment, it is up. And you can see a fall in the C20, which also play a role, a type of B lymphocytes, which play a role. There is a fall with the treatment and the other group as well.
Now the increased levels, and there's another study which is published also in 2011 in Journal of Rheumatology. It showed that increased levels of B lymphocytes activating factors in SLE are associated with acute phase reactants independent of genetics. And this is the, the picture. You can see the difference between the control healthy patients or patients without lupus and patients with SLE, there's a much higher level of the platelet activating factors, soluble ones in the, in the blood. This one showing the, all the figures from the trial, the studies, as you can see, the rate of response to uh, this drug between the control, the placebo, and the, and the blue, and those patients on one milligram per kg, and the patients on 10 milligram per kg over time. Same thing, okay? So what is the cumulative evidence of this, these studies? Reduced disease activities was shown across mucotinous, muscular, skeletal, and immunological system. That's complements and anti double strand DNA at week 52. And also it shows better clinical response in immunologically active patients. The more the patient is active, the better response. If you have low C3, low C4, and high anti-double strand DNA antibodies in a patient, you expect that you will have a better clinical response to a treatment. There was more durable responses, fewer relapse, flares, and less in new organ involvement with improved complement, lower autoantibody levels, and less need for all steroids. This is, this is an important point. This is one of the important targets in the study, is that more patients taking the, the drug could reduce their all steroid therapy to quarter of the dose. Keeping the dose of steroid less and less is one of the targets in our treatment of lupus patients. Same thing, well tolerated, sustained improvement in disease activity, decline in DLAC score and flares, okay? And generally well tolerated, there was no increase in opportunistic infections or in malignancies. This study in Lupus 2013 showed the effect of bilimab the treatment or renal involvement of lupus, lupus nephritis. The results suggest that belumumab may offer a renal benefit in patients with SLA. And this shows you the pictures comparing placebo and the gray with the drug one milligram and in blue and 10 milligram in violet, showing the difference in rate of remission and in the response. Also, it shows the reduction of proteinuria compared to the placebo Compared to the placebo, you can see that there is a reduction in the proteinuria and the treated groups, whether on one milligram or 10 milligram over time. There was another study showing the long-term safety and efficacy of belimumab in patients with SLE. So it's clean that safe and well tolerated by patients. The study demonstrates the long-term benefits in addition to standard therapy in patients with active SLE. 
it was well correlated and benefited with decrease in disease activity. Also, we stress, moreover, penicillin dosage was declined. And the other one is the accrual of organ damage. What is the accrual of organ damage? It is the accumulative damage which happens to the organs with time. So if you have lower and lower accrual of organ damage, this is good for your patient. This one also, this study showing that although it's been deleted, bilimumab plus standard of care therapy also improved SRR response, that's the lupus uh, response, and reduced disease activity and severe flares, and was generally well tolerated. And that's in 2011 when the FDA approval of Benima based on these studies. One of them is published in Arthritis and Rheumatism in 2011 by Fury Richard et al. and showing the difference in the response between the three groups, placebo, one milligram, and 10 milligram. Also, I'm showing you the same thing I think we've searched on before. In the Lancet, also there was the uh, study, the 51 study, and also showed significantly higher SR, SRI rates noted with the treatment by min, one milligram and 10 milligram compared to placebo, compared to placebo, again, in, in the same year. This is the same study showed the improvement. Now this is a very, very nice graph. I like that. I showed you that with the treatment of bilimumab, these patients, that there is a steady decrease in the dose of prednisolone over time, over weeks and years, there is a steady decrease in the dose of prednisolone dose. And this is one of our, should be one of our main aims in our patients with lupus, to keep them as low as possible on steroid, less than five milligrams, most of the time, if we can, less than five milligrams in order to make sure that less and less adverse effects of steroids. So the conclusion of these studies is that these two studies showed the efficacy of this drug and why it is approved for treatment in addition to the standard of care therapy. Compared with the placebo, to sum up, compared to placebo plus standard of care therapy, bilimumab plus standard of care therapy reduced SLE disease activity increased time to severe SLE flare, less steroid, so it has a steroid sparing effect, and reduced fatigue. And this is very important. Reducing fatigue is a good sign in our patients with lupus. As early as from the eighth week, there's been a decrease or reduction of fatigue in patients. So many things has improved improve the D, double strand DNA, increase complement levels, and resulted over a race of adverse uh, events uh, less compared to placebo. There was no increase in the rate of adverse events or serious adverse events in these patients, and it was well correlated in combination with standard of care therapy. Now, if I have some time, I have to spend a few minutes on our old friend hydroxychloroquine. Hydroxychloroquine hydroxychloroquine used 
is associated with a reduced risk of damage accrual in SLE patients. And this has been described in one of the papers also published in arthritis and rheumatology. As you can see, the time to accrual of a new damage is different between patients who are on hydroxychloroquine at time zero compared to people who are not on hydroxychloroquine. Very, very obvious. It is the most commonly used medication for lupus, an old one, effective for mild musculoskeletal manifestations, but also evidence suggests that it's protective against developing more severe organ involvement, and it made time for effectiveness. I mean, you have to be patient. As you can see from this graph depicted on your, on the side of the slide, that the long term of hydroxychloroquine or mortality, those with on chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine, have much better uh, survival than those without hydroxychloroquine. And I believe in that because I'm the one who always advocate the use of hydroxychloroquine to every patient of lupus. Every patient of lupus should have the advantage of taking hydroxychloroquine. And retinopathy, the recommendations, you can to refer to it in order to uh, uh, look or keep eye on the retina. Why hydroxychloroquine is so good? It also has antithrombotic properties. It, it's been shown to reduce RBCs and platelet aggregation. So it protects against development and thrombosis. Everybody, I think, knows that it is very much recommended in patients with antiphospholipid syndrome in order to mitigate arterial and or venous thrombosis. Antiphospholipid syndrome patients have got both arterial and venous thrombosis. They should have hydroxychloroquine throughout life, lifelong. They should have lifelong hydroxychloroquine with minimal toxicities. So it's well-recognized uh, beneficial effect. It uh, lowers the risk for a flare, lowers the risk for severe disease exacerbation, and lower the risk for new damage. In summary, hydroxychloroquine, old drug, but there is a new understanding. It's recommended for all patients because it improves rash arthritis, improves survival, reduces lipid level as well, antithrombotic effects, and reduces the risk of early cumulative damage, which is the damage accrual. And it also prevent flare-up of lupus nephritis particularly. In pregnancy, you should keep your pregnant patient on hydroxychloroquine, should be continued because it will confer the advantage of less lupus flares and improve the patient outcome. And there's no increased adverse events and there's no increased congenital malformations and as well as it is safe in breast feeding. I think Dr. Abbas, I think I take a long time, probably will leave. I have a lot to say, but... كل الوقت لك استاذ. كل الوقت لك راحتك استاذ. لا يعني بس it will take time. أزول يعني يعني جد أنا مسموح لي بعد. No comment. مسموح لك كل الوقت لك استاذ. يتعبون مو. يعني. احنا مستمتعين جدا يا استاذ لم ما تتعبت زين خل امشي تقريبا حاول بسرعه حتى بس اوصلكم المسج ارجو لايك رتوكزيماب على السريع رتوكزيماب اوف ايفريبادي نوز ات ان تي سي دي 20 دراج ات از بين يوز از بين يوز فور ليمفوما اديد تو ذا تشوب ثيرابي اند رتوكزيماب بلوكس uh, 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 blocks the uh, CD20 in patients with, with lupus and has been found. What is the, what is the, what is, 
idea of rituximab in patients with lupus nephritis. The trials are not well, didn't show very robust, robust evidence of response, but still there is complete response, there is partial response, and there is towards better response in patients with severe class three and class four, five renal disease lupus nephritis. And it hasn't been shown very effective patient with nephrotic syndrome and renal failure. So the conclusion is that tuximab may be an option for patients with lupus nephritis that is refractory to standard treatment, يعني تطيم cyclophosphamide, تطيم cyclophosphamide, IV, or oral, maistigy wound, then you have to try rituximab in these patients. Or those patients who experience a flare while on intensive treatment. مريض دياخد cyclophosphamide on maintenance. We see at the flare up, there is a place of using rituximab. And I have personal experience of using rituximab in such situation. مريضة ما استفادت من cyclophosphamide عدة جراح. I added rituximab and it did show a response. So this is the place of rituximab in patients with renal disease. Okay. Another drug, Astari Amshibi, Atasisept, I hope that another time in the future to elaborate more on this on these points. This, one, shall us, shall us. this one is a recombinant uh, 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 biologic, which reduces the level of bliss, but also it inhibits the proliferation uh, uh, inducing ligand, yani epro. Yani a test of tufrak and bilimumab is that it is dual. It is dual. It blocks bliss and it blocks epro. Both of them, both of them is blocked by this drug. And there are many papers which show the efficacy and safety of atacept in patients with SLE. You can see in this graph that the response, the response of the patients and down in the panel, in the lower panel, the decrease in the IgG. As we know, in lupus, we have hypergamma globulinemia. The decrease in IgG is taken in this study as a marker of response to this drug. Also, this one as well, efficacy of the drug in these patients, lupus. This one will sum up all things you want to know about a test set efficacy. You can see in panel A, there is a rise in complement C3. In panel B, there is a rise of complement C4. Both of them were reduced in active lupus. And panel C, you can see four fall in the anti double strand DNA antibodies. And as well as in panel D, there is a fall in our IgG, which indicate the active disease. Now, the last thing I would like to touch, which is very important, although I will take more of your time, but I will take my time in speaking about cardiovascular disease and SLE, which is very much important in patients who survive for many years, 10 years or more, cardiovascular disease risk is increased. Patients with SLE show significantly higher rates of clinical and subclinical cardiovascular disease, which is a major cause of morbidity and mortality in these patients. This is excess risk persists even if we control the standard, the traditional cardiovascular risk, which is familiar to everybody, such as diabetes 2, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and smoking, even if we correct these things, still there is a room 
for excess risk because of the disease activity plus the treatment, notably the steroids, the steroids. And this depict the factors which cause accelerated atherosclerosis and SLE, which is interplay between patient, disease, and the treatment associated factors. All of them is familiar to you, but all act together in lupus to increase the risk of accelerated atherosclerosis. And there are many calculators. One of them I love to, see, to show you is the cardiovascular risk calculator, which take in consideration, for example, significantly three things. Low serum complement three, increase activity more than two, and the history of lupus anticoagulant. These have a hazard ratio, a high hazard ratio for cardiovascular risk. And this is the contribution of the SLE risk factors. Again, activity, more than three, low C3, history of lupus, lupus anticoagulant, and uh, if you combine the three, you will have more. Two is more than one, three more than, and two, and so on, and so forth. Achieving and maintaining low disease activity, even if it is not clinical remission, is a protective against organ damage. And the rates of organ damage decline with increase of percentage of time in low lupus activity state. So, and this affect all the cardiovascular, the stroke, the MI, and the valvular disease. This study by Hug et al. in Journal of Rheumatology in 2010 show you UK SLE patients with the age of onset of coronary heart disease. And you can see that the author has put a mark over the age of 45 and 55 and below 45. So there is a high risk of coronary heart disease in these patients. And Ahmed et al. group in rheumatology 07 showed you the prevalence of carotid plaque in a Manchester cohort of patients. And you can see compared to the control that the SLE patients early, early in life, they develop, they develop cardio, uh, carotid plugs. They develop carotid plugs. So this is the publications again. There are traditional steroids are important. As we said, steroids should be kept down. Now, while the effects of aspirin and hydroxychloroquine is very notable on the rate of cardiovascular events, patients treated with aspirin in this study, in rheumatology 2017, patients treated with aspirin plus hydroxychloroquine or one of them as primary prevention and followed for 13 years showed prolonged cardiovascular related event free survival versus those treated with neither drug or with a combination. See the combination, which is the solid one, the upper one. Okay, this is survival, while the one which is interrupted has the lowest survival when the patients are not on either aspirin or hydroxychloroquine. So combination of these two is very good for our patients with lupus to minimize cardiovascular events. We said hydroxychloroquine has antithrombotic effect and you can see this graph. We have traditional risk factors. The difference between general population and the people with SLE. So SLE is considered coronary heart disease equivalent 
and we should keep idle targets in these patients with lower LDL, lower blood pressure, stop smoking, better control of diabetes, and bringing down the weight. Aspirin for those when it is indicated, and ACE inhibitors when it is indicated, well known to you, the indications of AC inhibitors. And this is show you that stroke and coronary heart disease risk compared between patients with SLE and the general population. And the story of lupus continues. I have to stop. I'm sorry. I took very long time. And وآخر دعوانا أن الحمد لله رب العالمين ثم الصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين والسلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته. وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته. وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله. شكرا. أستاذنا الفاضل محاضرة ممتعة جدا ومعلومات قيمة كالعادة الشكر أيضا موصول لكل الأخوان الحاضرين وعلى رأسهم أساتذتنا في أساتذة الطب الأستاذ الدكتور أسامة الناصري الأستاذ الدكتور سركيس من البصرة الأستاذ الفاضل دكتور عباس علي منصور والاخ الاستاذ الفاضل دكتور حازم عميد كليه الطب ذي قار لحضورهم معنا. المحاضره شي از اروماتولوجست شي از اسكينج اباوت اف ذير از ان رول اوف انفيريوم هاب مونوكلونال انتي بادي ان لوبس نفرايتس الون اور ان كومبينيشن ويز اذر مناسبات كان يو ريبيت ذا كويستشن Can you repeat the question? Uh, okay. Is there is any role for monoclonal antibody and ferrolumab in lupus nephritis alone or in combination with other immunosuppressive therapy? It's usually, it's usually in combination with a standard of care therapy, we call it, which is the usual therapy, the immunosuppression, and the steroid, but the advantage would be you will be able to, less, to use less and less steroid over time and to keep the activity down. So it's usually used at the moment, it's used in combination with standard of care therapy, the usual therapy that we steroids or immunosuppression. Now. Shukran, Mr. Another question she is asking, if we use Bilimab in acute flare, so when we suspect the response, so she mean the time of onset of Bilimab in effect? I don't have an answer to this question. Thank I have you. to look for And I didn't come across a study which specify this. I might look, but I don't have an answer at the moment. Shukran. Shukran, Saad. Saad, another question from Dr. Sura Shamma. Soal from Dr. Sura Shamma. She is asking, in the era of COVID-19, where, where a viral illness indu induced most of the its pathological effect or damage through an immuno a uh, coagulative mechanism, hey. much similar to the autoimmune disease, such Sahih. as SLE. Sahih. Whether it is possible or visible in the visible future, we may find an infectious agent that may cause SLE? Well, alhamdulillah, there are speculations, and know uh, there might be a viral etiology for lupus, but there is no solid evidence. And no, 
there is a viral infection or if it is which virus from a solid evidence for this we might in the future but we are not sure there is no solid evidence now another question from Dr. Amr Diab. what is the effect of COVID-19 infection in lupus patients as considers of autoimmune disease mild moderate or severe infection and is the lupus patient on hydroxychloroquine drug protective from COVID-19 yeah, as we need hydroxychloroquine is one of the protocol of treatment for COVID-19. Yes, to begin with, people thought that hydroxychloroquine would confer a protection for patients with lupus. But with time, it died away. And no, there's no benefit of hydroxychloroquine to patients with COVID-19. So to me, to me, patients with lupus should be on the same treatment as usual under normal conditions, but should be protected, protected from exposure to the virus and should be treated like other people, but with their treatment on. Yani they should have more protection, isolation than people would have, which have no lupus. Harish, but hydroxychloroquine, no more, there's no more evidence that it is protective or effective to patients with COVID-19. So I think it will change. I mean, if you have lupus, you will be on But I don't think taking hydroxychloroquine, I mean, in the end of the word, will protect him from getting COVID-19. وعندنا سؤال استاذ من الناصرية دكتور عماد حاتم يسأل is there is any role of a prophylactic anticoagulation in patients with membranous lupus nephritis as there is an increased risk of coagulopathy طبعا membranous nephropathy شوية بصورة عامة whether lupus or not carries a high risk of thromboembolism ف it would be the same thing as patients with ordinary membranes. Yani the membranes with severe nephrosis, with severe nephrotic syndrome, massive proteinuria, definitely the patient will benefit from prophylactic uh, uh, antithrombotic uh, treatment until he get remission or control of his proteinuria and his nephrosis. Now, a key to stuff. He is asking also, do do the ESR and C-reactive protein level are still included as a marker of lupus nephritis therapy? C-reactive protein no more get marker in lupus unless there is infection. Unless there is infection, the CRP may get in a door with lupus. Unless there is infection. Well, ESR, نعم. ESR, we are looking at it helps. But may you get to take the كصاد يعني مو حالة حالة ال C3 و C4 والدبل ستراند وهسه طلع البلس يعني بي لينفوسايت هذني هذني مو روبست مو روبست ايفيدنس فور ذيم ال ESR وهذا تلعب بها عوامل اخرى انفكشن غير شيء نعم استاذ الحديث معك ممتع بس راح اترك المجال لاخي دكتور عباس يكمل بقيه الاسئله شكرا جزيلا مع العفو استاذ دكتور ضياء بس سؤال وحتى يرجع لك لأنه عندي مو كل الأسئلة طالعة بس سؤال الأخير من دكتور حيدر شهيد إيه؟ إن بيشنت with the relapses of lupus nephritis استاذ إيه؟ while on intensive therapy إيه؟ which is preferable for your sir as your personal experience switching between mycophenolate مفتين and cyclophosphamide or using rotexumab Thank you very much, sir. Hey, Adi, yani hasa tibban el 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 advice on the hand to just to bed the bachelor. And now, when you have a patient on intensive therapy, standard intensive therapy, cyclophosphamide, MMF, or sar at the no response, or deterioration, or sar flare up, you add rituximab. Sometimes even you add it to cyclophosphamide, or you you switch from
from cyclophosphamide to rituximab. But some people, even they add the two. How did you? شكراً شكراً جزيلاً أستاذ دكتور ضياء كمل الأسئلة نعم شكراً جزيلاً أستاذ وإلك تحية خاصة من كلية الطب جامعة البصرة ينقلها الأخ دكتور عبد الأمير عبد الباري ويسأل أستاذي وأستاذه how we can reduce the risk of cardiovascular event how we can reduce the risk of cardiovascular event Can we implement a preventive measure in the early of disease, even in young patients, without risk factors? Yes. I'm sorry, I don't have a lot of time. I had a lot of slides on the cardiovascular risk. I think it's very important in this time. Yes, you start to implement, to implement all measures of Minimizing cardiovascular risk right from beginning. You know, those are marda, or lupus. Even if they are young, young, even if they are young, less than 45, than than 40, still because of their disease and their treatment, notably steroids, dihydrosteroids, steroids, they run the risk of cardiovascular disease. So you have to implement all the measures of cardiovascular risk. Right from beginning, نعم. it will have advantage for the patient. نعم. It's a very good point. This is a very good point. Uh, Dr. Haider Shaheed is a which type of a clinical manifestation of SLE for which Bilimimab is effective for? There's nothing specific. So I'm a call the markers of activity will be, will be affected. Faster the higher the disease activity, the better the response. For macrophage specific, C3, C4, double strand anti DNA, IgG level, all of them will be will show a difference in the treatment. Ma macrophage specific. The shafa, shafa, shafa. Now, the word that the record has is on the one. Less steroids. Thanian improvement in fatigue. Improvement in fatigue. Feeling of the patient of fatigue is improved with with the treatment. And then is Shayan, which is very important. Fahali Shafa. Doctor, I have a question from the court. The Muhammad Tawas. No. Doctor Sabah is L. How many doses of rituximab? How many doses of rituximab and time interval do you prescribe for a patient with resistant to start under usually, care? Usually you start with two doses in the same way you use it for lymphoma. يعني the same dose. يعني 375 milligram per uh, square meter. أعتقد هي الدوز اللي standard. وفارق بيناتهم two weeks. Two doses, two doses, two doses are two weeks apart. Let me per square meter. Farq benatum two weeks to begin with. Na. Shukran jazeelan start. Wo aku sual ila doktor Ali ila mujud. Na. Doktor Ali. Na. Doktor doktor Amr dia is el is calcium channel blocker has a tolerance means increase. The dose with the time, like a AC inhibitor? Yes. Thank you very much for the question. Actually, according to all of the guidelines, you need to start with the low dose of amlodipine or any other calcium channel blocker, which is about amlodipine, 5 mg, and you monitor your patient response. Shafaw, you know, and you know, the patient's response, the big part of the he gradually may need increasing the dose. فعجبا هل هذه الحاجة to increase the dose طبعا هذا الحكي فيما لو كان يستخدم amlodipine, calcium channel blocker أو حتى other antihypertensive classes ف is it due to the drug tolerance or is it due to the worsening of the hypertension condition صعب واحد يجاوب هذا السؤال however amlodipine يعني ما بي tolerance effect بقدر ما هو أنه يعني the patient condition may require increasing the dose
this is as far as I know. وإذا يعني حضراتكم اختصاص باطنية you may know uh, more information than me. شكرا دكتور و there is another question from Dr. Talib Tal. نعم. Uh, he said that it is well known that non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs mildly elevate blood pressure. نعم. Does, does this property observed strongly with amylopidine only or with other anti-hypertensive therapy? هنا عفوا بس إذا ممكن تعيد آخر جزء من السؤال. يسأل does this property Hey. Observe strongly with amylopidine only or with other antihypertensive therapy. نعم. حقيقة هي نفسها نون السيرويد الانتي انفلاماتوري دراكس قابليتها على زيادة البلاد براشر أو حتى interfering with the antihypertensive effect of antihypertensive agents تكون مختلفة. يعني تختلف من نون السيرويد إلى آخر. However, as we are talking about antihypertensive agents, شافوا أنه هي شنو الميكانيزم اوف اكشن اللي بيها النون ستيرويدال ممكن تزيد البلاد بريشر؟ طبعا هي ميجرلي هي ووتر اند صوديوم ريتنشن بسبب الافكت مالتها على البروستاجلاندينز اللي موجوده بالكدني. هنا املوديبين ميبي او كالسيوم شاب بلوكرز ان جنرال تعرفون ات اكتس باي ارتريولر فازو دايليتيشن ف ات از امونج ذا كلاسز ذات ار مينيمالي افكتد باي ذيس ميكانيزم اوف فلويد اند ووتر ريتنشن Because the water and sodium retention, so uh, we think or we expect that amlodipine um, uh, maybe here we can, like we saw in the research, superior to other agents or to other classes like AC inhibitors or ARBs. Because uh, uh, other classes, uh, may uh, their mechanism of action on the kidney may be affected by the effect of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. هذا اللي موجود بالكلينيكال ترايلز بمعنى انه الاملوديبين هنا ماي بي ا بيتر اوبشن اذا كنا نحكي على مونوثيرابي فور اكزامبل ان كيسز اوف انكريز بلاد بريشر ميدييتد باي نون ستيرويدال انتي انفلاماتوري دراج وطبعا بالمناسبه هو حتى البوتنشال تو انكريز بلاد بريشر باي نون ستيرويدال هو قد يكون انسيجنيفيكانت او سيجنيفيكانت حسب الكيس يعني not always you need to change the antihypertensive agent. شكرا جزيلا دكتور. شكرا جزيلا دكتور. نعم تفضل. نعم نعم دكتور ضياء. نعم. Dr. Dia? Hey, I have a question. Okay. So it's clear? Clear. Clear. So, Dr. Afwan, clear. Assalamu alaikum, Mr. عليكم السلام والرحمة أستاذ أنا عندي فت سؤال إذا تقدر إذا خصتك إحنا بالبراكتس يعني in these days we face COVID-19 cases a lot of cases of COVID-19 in patient with SLE when facing patient with SLE and COVID-19 what's your opinion about the treatment high dose steroid dexamethasone Immunosuppressive, which we are using, for example, Actimira, which is slow. Is there any effect, bad effect, on management of SLE, or is there any significant improvement? Is there any opinion about this medication? مختصر مفيد. There is no difference in treatment. The patient will stay on the same treatment, but he will be protected from the exposure to the viral infection because it will be bad for him who are on immunosuppression who are lupus immunosuppressed we a viral infection eg on top of it on top of it it's very bad but who could my radina and no marifna of lupus on treatment on active treatment should be protected mark for cheese mark for cheese of it together so we yeah 
without with medication, medication of uh, COVID, is there any effect on patients with lupus? Akid. Oh, we no, use a lot of medication, immunosuppressant. Hey, Akid. And high dose steroid, dexamethasone, tazolimumaba. With that, they say that your patient with lupus should be protected. أكثر من غيره يعتبر high risk group high risk group high risk group so he should be protected more than others from COVID-19 شكرا جزيلا أستاذ شكرا جزيلا شكرا جزيلا دكتور ضياء شكرا خلصنا خلصنا هسه دكتور ضياء كلمة دكتور ضياء ها خوش وأنا كلمة دكتور ضياء دكتور ضياء اوكي از ذير اني كويشن اوكي اي اي اختم هو استاذ احسان وانا اختم هو الجميع كان لقاء ان شاء الله ان شاء الله هذا يكون الاخير ونلتقي على الدوام والطول دكتور ضياء أنا كلمة قصيرة أتقدم بها بالشكر الجزيل لأستاذي الفاضل لأستاذي الدكتور إحسان شماع اللي أعطانا وقت واستمتعنا بهذه المحاضرة العلمية وإن شاء الله إن شاء الله رح تتكرر هاي الفعالية مع الأستاذ الدكتور إحسان شماع ومع كل الأساتذة اللي موجودين بالعراق شكري واعتزازي واحترامي وتقديري لجميع الأساتذة المشاركين في هذه المحاضرة ولكل أخواني وأخواتي مع حفظ الألقاب والمستمعات متمنين لهم دوام الصحة والعافية في هذا الظرف الصعب أيضا أشكر الأخ الغالي والعزيز الدكتور ضياء خلف العمري على هذه إدارة ناجحة للجلسة وعلى هذا القلب الطيب والعلم الغزير شكرا جزيلا له من القلب وأتقدم بالشكر الجزيل لشركة أسينو داعم ودائما داعم لجمعية أطباء الباطنية في ذيقار وللأخ العزيز الدكتور ليد جبار ممتمنين لهم النجاح والتوفيق دكتور علي محسن ما أنساه علم في التقديم شكري وتعز واعتزازي بالدكتور علي محسن خاف نسيناك آخر واحد نعتذر شكرا جزيلا شكري للجميع إن شاء الله الصحة والسلامة للجميع وإن شاء الله نلتقي فعاليات مستقبلا علمية أكثر وأكثر شكر من الناصرية للجميع للجميع وإن شاء الله السلامة والصحة والعافية للجميع شكرا جزيلا شكرا جزيلا للجميع وإن شاء الله موفقين ونلتقي بكم على الخير إن شاء الله شكرا جزيلا أستاذي شكرا جزيلا دكتور علي شكرا جزيلا دكتور ضياء شكرا جزيلا دكتور ليث شكرا جزيلا للجميع شكرا جزيلا شكرا جزيلا الله يوفقكم هذا بشكر موفقين إن شاء الله مع السلامة مع السلامة